Hello everybody and welcome back. In this episode of Quantum Mechanics Made Simple, we are going to look at the double slit experiment, also called the Young Slit experiment. Now, in the last video, we saw the wave-particle duality of electrons, where electrons seemingly display properties both associated with waves and associated with particles. And this is a real puzzle, right? Because waves and particles are two entirely distinct physical objects. So it seems completely contradictory for one physical object, the electron, to have properties of both waves and particles literally at the same time. And in no experiment is this wave-particle duality more startlingly apparent than in the double slit. The double slit is also the first instance we have of observation changing the outcome of an experiment. That is, whether an experiment is observed or not literally changes how the particles in that experiment behave. Now, unsurprisingly, this is probably the most discussed area in quantum physics because it seems to place an almost godlike role on this observer. And all of our natural logic and reasoning tells us that any precisely defined physical theory like quantum mechanics shouldn't have to resort to such godlike roles in order to explain the universe. Now, we are going to get to the point where we do formulate a theory of quantum mechanics based on the observations we see, and as a quick spoiler, we will be doing it without placing a godlike role on the observer, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. First, we need to see the experiment, and you're in for a treat. It's probably my favourite experiment in the entirety of physics, because what it tells us about the nature of reality is totally non-intuitive and totally mind-bending and really quite beautiful. Now, the double slit experiment takes place in the same apparatus as the single slit experiment we saw in the last video. I won't go through it all again, but suffice to say, here we have a negatively charged cathode, a positively charged anode, which has an aperture or hole in it, and a phosphor-coated screen. And here we have a variable controlled heating element, which we can turn up or down to put more or less heat into the system. And what we found was, we put this barrier, which had a long but thin slit in it, and we put that over here, between the anode and the screen, and we found that at high temperatures, um, what we had is an image on the screen which was an exact image of the slit in the barrier we put up there. And then we turned the heating element down, we brought the energy of the system down, and we found that that single solid image turned into a number of discrete little flashes. Um, but importantly, all those flashes were within the outline of the original solid image. And this is what suggests the particle-like nature of electrons. But then what we found, if we go back up to a high energy, high heating element, is that when we made the width of this single slit thinner, at first we just got a thinner image of the slit, but then something very unexpected happened. Once we got to a certain thinness, past a threshold, the image on the screen suddenly became much, much wider. And this is an effect known as diffraction. And what we saw was that when we have a series of plane waves traveling in this direction, and they approach some barrier, which is very narrow, then when they come out the other side of the barrier, they become circular waves like this. They no longer are plane waves. And this suggests that the electrons are not particles, but are in fact waves. But then what we found is that as we turned the heating element down with this very, very narrow slit, again, we saw these individual flashes. Only this time, they were much more spread out. They could land anywhere where the diffraction pattern was seen at high voltage. And this is the simultaneous property of particles and waves which we saw. However, there is another property associated with waves, and that's called superposition or interference. And what this tells us is that whenever we have two or more equivalent waves moving through the same space, to get the resultant wave, the wave that we actually experience, what we have to do is sum the contributions from each of the individual waves. So here you can see a red wave and a blue wave. And to get the resulting white wave, the wave that we actually experience, what we have to do is at each point in space, we have to sum the contributions from the red wave and the blue wave. Now, this means that there will be some areas where the red wave and the blue wave are working against each other and cancel each other out, where we see no activity whatsoever. And there will be other areas where the red wave and the blue wave 
are working in the same direction as each other, and in these areas we will see twice as much activity as before. And this is an effect known as superposition. So now in the double slit experiment, again what we do is we place a barrier up between the anode and the screen, but whereas in the single slit we just had one thin slit, in the double slit we have two. And what do we see happen? Well, when the electrons approach this double slit, here we have two openings instead of one, and the electrons behaving as plane waves, remember, at each of these openings produce new circular waveforms. And what we see is that by, these, by the time these waves have arrived at the phosphor covered screen, they interact by superposition. And we have some areas where they cancel each other out and we see no um, pattern whatsoever. And we have other areas where they reinforce each other and we have a much brighter pattern than before. So whereas with the single slit we had a single wide diffraction pattern, by the time we get up to the double slit we have a much more complicated pattern, an interference pattern with bands of high activity alternating with bands of low activity. So now the question naturally arises, what happens when we turn the heating element down in this double slit experiment? Well just like with the single slit where we saw the wide diffraction solid state pattern disappear and be replaced by a number of individual flashes, so too with the double slit we see that the solid state pattern of interference bands disappears and is replaced by a number of individual flashes. However, what is really surprising is that those individual flashes will only occur in those regions where the interference bands can be seen at high voltage. Thus, this experiment displays properties of the electrons both as waves in the solid state interference bands and as particles in the individual flashes. But what is really surprising is that even when we turn the heating element down, so the energy is so low that we just get one electron at a time firing through our system, there are places where that electron can literally never land. That electron is limited to only ever landing in those places where the interference bands are seen at high energy. So we're left in the incredibly biz bizarre position that even when we have a single particle-like electron creating a single flash on the screen, somehow that electron seems to be sensitive to the conditions at both of the slits simultaneously. Now, we're gonna go over this one more time because it is so startling. So please do pay attention and focus on how crazy this is. Suppose that each electron that reaches the screen passes through either the left slit or the right slit. Now, naively, we would expect that to get the final distribution of electrons, what we could do is say, right, let's close off the right slit and see what we get when just the left slit is open. But of course, we know what this is, right? That's the same as the single slit pattern we saw previously, namely a single wide diffusion pattern. Um, and then we could say, right, well, let's now close off the left slit and see what happens when only the right slit is open. And again, we get a single diffusion pattern, but shifted over a bit to the right. And then we would say, right, well, we would then expect for the double slit when both slits are open to have a simple sum of both these diffusion patterns. But of course, that's not what we see at all. When both slits are open, we don't have a sum of single slit patterns. Instead, we have a much more complicated pattern of interference bands, that is, there are some places where an electron can fall if either the right slit is open or the left slit is open, but that electron cannot fall in those places when both slits are open. So that means that the electron has to be a wave, right? Because the electron is sensitive to the position or to the state rather of both slits at the same time. The electron must be spread out to interact with both slits at once. But again, the fact that when it hits the screen, it creates just a single flash, means that the electron must be a particle because a wave simply does not behave like that. Got that? Good, because things are about to get a whole lot stranger. So, since our puzzle concerned which slit the electron travels through, it makes sense to say, why don't we just check? And here, what checking means is adding something to our experimental setup 
which yields direct information about which slit the electron travels through. Now, there are all different types of ways we could do this. We could have a big box with a magnetic field to do this. But remember, what we're trying to do is build up a fundamental physical theory. So what we need to do is imagine the most fundamental and simple possible modification we can make to this apparatus to yield this result. And this is what I propose. What we're going to do is, so this is a blown up representation of this double slit. Here are the two slits. And in between, we're going to say, let's make this a hollow chamber. And in that hollow chamber, we are going to place a single proton. Now, a proton is a positively charged particle. And we know from electromagnetism that positively charged particles are attracted to negatively charged particles. So this electron, which is negatively charged, if this were to go through this top slit here, then that would exert an attractive force on this proton and the proton would be pulled towards that slit. Similarly, if the electron moves through this slit instead, it will attract a force on the proton pulling it in the opposite direction. So what we're going to do is we are going to put a screen, a miniature screen at each end of this chamber. And if the proton is pulled towards this end, it will create a flash on this screen. And if the proton is pulled towards this end, it will create a flash on this screen. Or if the electron somehow goes through both slits at once, the proton will be pulled equally in both directions and it won't create a flash on either screen. So this is the modification we're going to make to yield information about which slit the electron travels through. And at first, we are going to assume that this works with 100% accuracy. That is, every time the electron passes through this top slit, we'll get a flash on that screen. And every time it travels through this bottom slit, we'll get a flash on that screen. And we will modify that later, but for now, that is what we're going to assume. So what do we see when we start running this experiment with this extra layer of checking which slit the electron goes through? Well, what we see is that sometimes the proton gets pulled upwards and we see a flash here. Sometimes it gets pulled downwards and we see a flash here. And this happens roughly half the time. So 50-50, it gets pulled in each direction. Um, but what is incredibly surprising is that when we have this observation, the interference pattern, which we saw on the screen before, completely disappears. And instead, what we see are, is a single, much wider diffraction pattern, which is actually totally equivalent to two single slit patterns overlaid one on top of the other. That is, as soon as we have information about if the electron goes to the left slit or the right slit, then we lose this complicated band of interference pattern. And instead, we have two single slit patterns overlaid on top of each other, one for the left slit and one for the right slit. That is, the nature of the electron's behavior has fundamentally changed because of being tracked through which slit it goes through. So here we have an example of observation changing the behavior of particles. Whether or not we observe which slit these electrons go through literally changes which parts of space those electrons can travel through. Now, in the last video, we asked the question, what can this observer be? And it seems like there's a godlike role on this observer, and it feels like something which no fundamental physical theory could ever satisfactorily incorporate into it because it's just so vague and ambiguous. But here, we actually have cause for great hope because the observer, far from being a scientist or anything ineffable like that, we have reduced the observer down to a single proton. And a single proton feels intuitively like the kind of thing we can incorporate into a fundament fundamental physical theory of reality, of nature. And without giving too much away, that's exactly the course we're going to proceed down. But before that, um, we have one more question very briefly to discuss, which is what happens when this measuring device does not work perfectly accurately? Let's say it only works 50% of the time. What do we see then? Well, if we were to run this experiment at a high energy with this working 50% of the time, what we see is that half of the electrons that travel through here, 
Um, half of them, this device manages to record which slit they go through, and those electrons are observed. And for those electrons, the diffraction pattern is analogous to two single slit diffractions layered on top of each other, right? They can land anywhere on the screen. Whereas the other half of the electrons, the electrons for which this measuring device does not react, the ones for which we have no information about which slit they travel through, those electrons are restricted to only landing within the bounds of the interference pattern we saw with no measurement. So if we have a measuring device which only works half the time, we find an overlay of the two patterns. On the one hand, half of the electrons form the interference bands, and the other half of the electrons form the two single slit patterns. And so we actually get a mixture of both of these. So, we've now seen four different experiments, each of which sheds light on a different aspect of quantum mechanics. And there are other experiments we have to go through which reveal yet more aspects of quantum, but what we're going to do in the next video is begin to dive into the actual formalism of quantum mechanics, the so-called quantum recipe. We're going to look at wave functions and sample space and how those two things work together. And once we start to get an idea of these concepts, we combine them with the observations we get from the experiments we've seen and start to piece together a physical theory which accounts for everything we see. And that physical theory will give a very counterintuitive but a very precise nature of reality.